Okay, so I finished Worm Part 18, and I'm gonna talk about it. I want to talk about it, but I feel like there's something else I need to get off my chest first. I gotta go back to Worm 17 for a bit. So, the more I've thought about it over, like, I don't know how long has it been, like a week, or like, over like a couple days, it just kind of hit me. It's like, you know, I really like the Traveler's backstory. I like, you know, seeing them interact with each other. I like all the shit with the Seamer. I think that's so fucking cool. The fact that they're Isekai characters is pretty fun. You know, it's a superhero story. So, you know, it, the fact that there's a multiverse makes sense. You know, it shit just kind of has to happen. But the more I thought about it, the more I just kind of went, hold on a second. Is there an actual, like, Isekai light novel anime whatever medium it is, because one will kind of usually become the other. Is there one that's like this yet? Because this sounds like an absolute fucking goldmine of an idea. You have a team of actual pro gamers who get isekai into another world. There, they all get superpowers, and they have to become super villains and have to do, like, really seedy shit theoretically but also have things that they're not comfortable doing but you, then you've got people like trickster who are like look whatever it takes to get home to fix noel i am willing to do and then you have someone like sundancer who's like there's just there are lines i do not feel comfortable crossing and you see how their morality is tested you see how their bonds are tested i mean with what we see of the travelers now those bonds especially with between like luke and kraus that bond is gone. That sounds like it would be such an interesting story to watch. And you also see it's like, okay, like these are their roles as pro gamers. Like here's the DPS, here's the tank, here's the strategist. And now that they have superpowers, how have those roles evolved? How have they changed? How are they able to apply that to being a supervillain team? That sounds like that would actually be a really good Isekai story. I feel like that's one that people would like absolutely read and absolutely watch. Like, does does something like that exist? Did Wild Blow just be like, I'm gonna make the best Isekai story of all time, and it's just gonna be backstory? And I also want to say this. As much as I would love to read the Traveler's backstory, just, like, give me this whole series. As much as I would love to write something like that, I'm very glad they're not the protagonists of Worm. I feel like with what Worm... I mean, I feel like they could still pull it off. But I, there was something I was reading the other day. I was like, what is the theme of Worm? The number one theme of Worm is... There are good people who want to make the world a better place, that have that intention to make the world a better place, that have the means to make a world a better place. And even if it feels like they lack the means at times, they don't always have all the ideas down, they work on those intentions and the world is affected. The second theme of Worm is those intentions aren't enough. And the fact that you don't have all your ducks in a row, the fact that you haven't figured everything out means that, yeah, there's room for shit to go bad. And that happens a lot. I, I remember I was watching a video. I was watching like a short the other day about Dungeons and Dragons. And there's a line where a character says, Hey, I thought this was a game about free choice. And another character says, Actually, it's a game about cause and effect. Which I think is probably the best way I've ever heard D&D described. That in cooperative storytelling. Worm is most definitely a story about cause and effect. And I think that could work very well with the Travelers. But I feel like having a character like Taylor. Someone who has been down on her luck has been actively abused by society and still saying I don't want to use my power to get back at the people who hurt me I don't want to take over the world I just want to make the world a better place and I genuinely from the core of my soul mean that however 
I have to get my hands dirty to do so. And sometimes I intentionally get my hands dirty, but it's justified, it's okay. And there's other times you're like, oh boy, I completely unintentionally did that. And how that, like I talk about Skinner morality and her flexible morality. I think that is really what you need from the protagonist of Worm. And I feel like you could have something like that with Krauss, assuming he would be the protagonist, I feel like he would be. But I feel like with Krauss, it's a, it feels less flexible. He's just amoral. And that's not a bad thing. It feels like a weird thing to say. It's not a bad thing that your main character is an absolute piece of shit. I still think he's super interesting, though. And you do have his justification of, I gotta get my friends home, I have to protect Noelle. But I feel like with the story that Wild Blow has been trying to tell, at least what I have seen of it so far... I think someone like Taylor is the perfect protagonist for it. That being said, I would totally read spinoffs. I am sure there's a lot of fan fiction that can supplement that too. I feel like if he were to make, um, if he were to make spinoffs like about the travelers, I, from what I understand, Faultline was another character who could have been the protagonist. We'll, we'll get to her interlude later in this video. I, I feel like it would be kind of interesting. Again, just like a super superhero, super villain. I mean, they're they're mercenaries, so they're. I feel like again, kind of questionable morality because I don't know exactly what their line is. I think I have heard them say like, "We don't kill people. We don't take jobs to kill." That potentially also could have been a really cool like protagonist. But I am. I know it's something I say a lot. Like I have my criticisms of Taylor. I have my criticisms of the Undersiders. I am very happy with them as protagonists. So, with that tangent out of the way, let's actually talk about arc 18. It's the Noelle arc, because Noelle's a fucking problem. She is, um... I don't know if you can hear them in the background. Jose's, uh, Jose's on his lunch break. I'm also gonna drink some water real quick. Hmm. Noelle is a problem. Noelle is, for all intents and purposes, a baby end bringer. Um, what Lisa's kind of able to deduce with her power is, I don't think the Endbringers were ever human. Cauldron are the people that are making superpowers. Whatever was in Noelle's formula, I think that was their attempt to make an Endbringer. And you'll know, have an end like having something that strong that A, you can use to fight the Endbringers, and two... Cool, now you have an Endbringer in your pocket, so what is anyone really gonna do to stop you? Like, aside from Scion, who can? Um, I think that's actually pretty interesting. There's this really fun kind of back and forth with the PRT about what to classify her as, because they talk about S-level threats. So the S-level threats are the Endbringers, the Slaughterhouse Nine... I did look up the other two because it's static curiosity. I didn't go super far into it. It's like, who were considered the other S-tier threats? Nelbog, who we saw in that one, um, that one interlude that I think was in the Coil arc with those soldiers going into that town and they're just getting attacked by all these people who are, like, deformed and have powers and shit. That was Nilbog and someone called Sleeper. I have no idea who Sleeper is. I'd say I have no idea what it can do. My assumption is they can put people to sleep or, like, put them in a dream. Like, if you're an S-tier threat, it's probably some really weird shit or it's, like, I can put someone to sleep and see what's in their dreams and take their dreams into reality. God, I hope that's what that is. That sounds fucking gnarly. I don't know if this is a worm character. I don't know if this is a ward character, but regardless, I know that's an S-tier threat. I don't even know if they're still active. Um, so, like, when there's an S-tier threat, the sirens go off, it's people you need to evacuate, you can't be here anymore, kill order is in effect, capes from everywhere are coming in to help, and they're like, this is an S-tier threat, she is an Endbringer, she's about to be an Endbringer, we need more people in the PRT. She's an A-level threat, like, she's a problem. This is, uh, we should probably drop everything to help, but, uh, she's not that bad, I don't know, it's the kind of politicking bureaucracy bullshit that I just really enjoy in Worm. Um, what else was going on in this early part? 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I saw the computer go dead for a second. I'm not using it for this. I have my notes written down. But we had lost power because of a tornado a few days ago. And when I saw the screen go blank, I went, oh, shit. The power's dead. You know, even though the fucking light's on. Sorry. Got distracted. Anyways. So, Noelle is a problem. She is actively rampaging. The PRT show up to talk to the undersiders about this because Taylor and Lisa are now the queens of the underworld, <laughs> which is one of those things where I'm like, yeah, you remember, uh, you remember arc one when Taylor was like, I, it's time. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go out in costume. I'm going to help people. I'm going to save somebody. I'm going to be a superhero. Oh, wow. I am in completely over my head. Fast forward to Arc 18. So you're probably wondering how I got here. I'm now the queen of my town's underworld. <laughs> I fucking love Lorb. Anyways, um, PRT show up. They say that Vista has disappeared. They think she's been kidnapped. And they believe the undersiders are responsible. Because A, well, there's no real villains left in the city. Who else could do it? And two, yeah, you kind of already did this shit with Shadowstalker. Like, okay, fair. We did. We had nothing to do with this. If she's gone, it's probably because of Noelle. We were actually going to go talk to you guys because Noelle is a problem. I really like a lot of the conversations we have with the PRT. Number one, I was saying, like, all the bureaucracy about the A-level threat, the S-level threat. Eidolon shows up, and he has a private conversation with Lisa, where Lisa talks about how he's like, yeah, he's losing his powers. Which is a really interesting concept of, okay, so is that because that's just how powers work? There is a limited amount, there is a finite amount. Is that just the limit of his power? Because it's not natural to him he borrows powers and copies powers so there is a limit to the copying because it's not natural which also leads to is it because it's not natural because he didn't have a trigger event because he's a cauldron baby i don't know so it's like with taylor could she run out of her ability to use her bugs like what what is the limit to that like this is this is actually kind of interesting. Like, can a passenger, like, how sentient is a passenger? Which, when you get to Noelle's part or her interlude, seem like, oh, a passenger is very sentient. Can a passenger die? And I would assume, like, if a person dies, their passenger probably goes with them, but it might be the passenger just kind of goes back into the ether and can go to another planet or another multiverse. I don't know. Can a passenger die? But the person is still alive, but when the passenger goes, the power dies with them. So maybe that's what's happening. Or it's like every time you use their power, it's like you're draining the passenger's life force. Like this was the mechs in Bokurano. Like, I don't fucking know, but this is so interesting. Like I say, it's like, I love the politicking and the ethics. I love the world building. There's so much shit in a world. And like, I just want to know how all of this shit works. And I just want to know if Crawler fun and <laughs> Anyways, um, that's something they talk about. There's, I'm holding off on the conversation between Taylor and Clockblocker. That's one of my favorite parts of the arc. I think there was another conversation. Uh, also, not before Noelle's ultimatum. Ah, fuck, I thought I had it. I was like, there was something else that they talked about. Maybe I'm just forgetting. So I'll get to that other shit. Oh, no, I remember now. It's when... The Undersiders, I think it was Lisa kind of taking point in the conversation. Maybe it was Taylor when they're at the PRC headquarters. They're like, okay, so we kind of also, while we're here, just kind of want to say our vision of the city and what our goal is. Our vision of the city, I know we're super villains, so it's probably going to sound really egomaniac, mega maniacal, and all that shit. We want to have a genuine working relationship with the PRT going forward. We have our territories. We want to keep our territory safe. We want to keep the people in them happy. We we want to make Brockton Bay great again. It's like we want to make sure that we can rebuild the city. We want to like improve its infrastructure. We want to make sure the economy is going well. Yes, we're villains. 
we're going to do some illegal shit. But don't, like, trust us. We don't want to do, I mean, you probably don't trust us, but we don't want to do, like, murder. We don't want to do kidnapping, extortion. None of that crazy shit. We've got some illegitimate, like, we're not going to be selling drugs. We, we don't believe in that shit. We want what you want. Safety and stability for the city and her citizens. When other people come from out of town, like other capes, if they want to be heroes, we are totally fine with them joining the PRT and helping the cause of keeping Brockton Bay safe. If they want to be a villain, we'll take them in. We'll have like a screening process. If their vision of the city doesn't align with ours, we won't take them in. And if they are a rogue villain like that or something like the Nine, we want to drop everything, work together with you to get rid of them. Like, that that sounds fair, right? It's like, I get, like, I like all this shit. One of my two favorite, two, one of my two favorite parts of the arc is Skitter's conversation with Clockblocker. Where Skitter's like, okay, so Vista got kidnapped. That's bad. You guys don't trust us. Here's what I'll do. I will be your willing hostage. Like, I'll, uh, here's my weapons. I'm gonna take all the bugs, like, out of my hair and out of my costume. I guess I'll have a couple on me. Also, she can't fucking see because of, uh, the coil bombs. Like, yeah, I need my bugs to be able to see anything, which is also a cool way of ex escalation because I remember in arc one, when she's first fighting Lung, it's dark, she can't see anything, she has her bugs out, and she still can't see anything. And so you're like, oh, her power has really evolved. Or at the very least, the way that she uses her power has evolved. Because now she literally can't see, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it still matters. Having a bug doesn't really help her read. And she can't really see facial expressions when people are talking. But she can still use the bug sense of touch to have an idea of what's going on. And I genuinely don't know if this is permanent or not. She's like, I'll be your willing hostage. It's fine. It's cool. And Clockblocker's like, okay. This is my one shot. Do not miss this chance to blow. I got a bone to pick with you, Skitter. You... Do you know why I don't like you? And then Miss Malicious like, Dennis? Oh, she doesn't call him Dennis because he can't be using his name. It's like, Clockblocker? Stand down. Don't antagonize. I was like, it's fine. It's fine. I want to be an open book. I want to be able to talk to you guys, you know, like in a bit. I'm going to talk about the relationship that the undersiders want to have with the PRT. It's cool. What's your bone to pick? I hate that you're always on this high horse. That you, despite being a villain, are always looking down on us and saying like, well, you guys have a bureaucracy. Your hands are tied. You guys are hypocrites. And it's not because I think you're right. It's because I think you're just as much of a hypocrite as you claim us to be. Do you have any justification for the things that you've done? Because I'd love to hear them. I would love to go back and forth with you on all of these things. And they have this conversation. And one of my favorite parts is when they talk about Amy and Victoria. And he's like, yeah, like, do you... After Aegis died, we got to see him. When Gallant died, Vista got to see him. They didn't show us what happened to Victoria Dallins. The only... Amy did whatever she did to Victoria after you talked to her. You were the last person to see her before this shit went down. You care to explain yourself? I'd be happy to. So what Amy did to Victoria was not on us. Like genuinely, no bullshit. Uh, Victoria got injured by Crawler. Amy needed to fix her. We told Amy, you need to fix her and also undo what you did to her previously. Amy didn't want to. We offered her a spot on the Undersiders. She said she didn't want to take it. That's fine. That's allowed. The next time I saw her, Victoria was fucked up. 
if there's anyone to blame, it's probably Jack, because Jack was the one that was talking to her in the school. I was doing what I could to stop Jack from getting to her, but this isn't on me. And uh, I don't remember what the other one was. Oh, no, it was Shadowstalker. Because like, there were other things they talked about. He's like, okay, what about Shadowstalker? She was a teammate. Piece of shit. I will not deny that she was an awful fucking person. She was still a teammate. She was still a person. And after you guys had her, she went home, violated her parole, attacked her family. Her mom doesn't want her anywhere near her anymore. And... Yeah, after that, I can't say I blame her. And then she tried to kill herself by hanging herself with an electrical cord. How the fuck can you talk about a moral high ground when you did that to a person? Taylor, not knowing this happened because Regent's like, yeah, I just let her go. It's fine. I was like, nah, I got a toy to play with. And I'll still say Regent's, uh, Regent's interlude is probably one of my favorites. It's chilling as fuck. It's so good. And Taylor's response is... I had no idea. I didn't know that happened. Like, I'll be honest with you. Like, I think Shadowstalker's an awful fucking person. When I found her identity, genuine accident. Her response to that was to seek me out and fucking kill me. She tried to slit my throat. I feel bad about what happened, because I didn't know about that, I'll be honest. Like, I feel bad about that on a fundamental human level, but she's also a piece of shit. Yeah, you also kidnapped and tortured a person because she was, like, she had beef with you? That's fucked up. No, no, I'll concede that. Like, no, no, that is kind of fucked up, I won't lie. But the part I love, it's after she says, like, yeah, like, I didn't know what the fuck happened to Victoria afterwards. I didn't know what happened to Shadowstalker afterwards. Huh. You know, it's pretty common with you, huh, Skitter? You know, you have your goals, you'll justify it in some way to make yourself feel better. Damn the consequences, right? It doesn't matter what happens afterward. You don't concern yourself with afterward, do you? I'm like, yeah, that's, that is what Worm is in a nutshell. You have your desire to make the world a better place and you do it intentions aren't enough because you are gonna affect the world in one way or another and there's always fallout to that and i love that i think it's so interesting i loved this scene and then afterwards this malicious like yeah clock blocker um i told you not to do this several times this is going on your permit record your <laughs> patrols are getting fucked fine by me i i got what i wanted here i loved that fucking scene but then you know, um Talking to the PRT, all that stuff I said earlier. Noel, I don't remember, did they call Noel or did Noel call in? I think Noel called in and was like, hey, um, so couple things, some updates. Number one, I'm the problem. Number two, I've kidnapped Vista and I'm uh, making her clones and she's doing all this shit. Number three, Vista's dead. She's not. Vista's dead. Uh, you might want to get on this soon. Number four. Bring me the Undersiders and I stop. I just want them. I want them because Coyle gave me a way where I could be fixed and they took that from me. So I want to take, I want to get my revenge. I want to eat them. I want to rip them apart. I want it done, but I want to take my time when I have them. I'm going to be fucking up this city until I find them. If you bring them to me, I'll leave the city. All my clones, I'll kill them if you give me the Undersiders. For every subsequent hostage that I take, any future cape, because I will be taking you. You give me an Undersider, you get a hostage back. No questions, no strings attached. And once I've got them all, I'm gone. So the Undersider starts sweating a little bit, They're like, hey, heroes, plus no. To which Miss Militia's like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Like, that's, that's fucked up. That goes beyond, um, like, our personal code. Assault in the background. Hey, I think we totally should. No, Assault, we're not gonna do that. 
And I remember it was Triumph in particular. It was also like, no, we're not going to do that. And Skitter's just kind of thinking to herself, given the fact that I nearly killed him like a few days ago, I'm kind of surprised he's sticking up for me. Thank you. Sincerely appreciate it. But, um, all right, we take that. And essentially they're like, okay, we're going to work together to do this shit. If the Undersiders take advantage of the situation and, like, try to hurt any of us. Like, if if we don't think they're really on the up and up with this situation, it's shit that they genuinely manufactured to get more territory or control. If it's clear that they want to bring other heroes in the city just to get them killed by Noel, you know, all that kind of shit, then we're putting a kill order on them. And Taylor goes, oh! That's what's on the nine. Wow, I didn't think I would ever be like in the same sentence as them in that regard. Oh boy. Um, I mean, we're not gonna like this is legitimate. We're not gonna try to take advantage of it and hurt anybody or kill anybody. So that's fine. Just fuck, man. Um, I think after that, it's really just there's a bunch of people who come in from out of town. There's some wards from Chicago. There's this dude named, uh, like, Tecton, who, he's a tinker. I think his thing is that it's specifically with, like, the Earth and earthquakes. It's Tecton, like, tectonic plates. And he's got these gauntlets, which he can punch and, like, make fissures in the ground. Like, he has an earthquake punch. This is so cool. I don't remember his teammates. Like, there was Grace, who I think was, like, a martial artist. It was, like, in like, better balance and agility and, like, shit like that. There was this one dude, I don't remember what it was. It was, like, he has, like, a spirit form or some shit. It, it was kind of cool. I, I remember, oh, there was this other dude, what was it? It was Raymaster, because Regent thought his name was fucking stupid. It was either Regent or Imp. It, it, either one of them is believable. It's like, that name is fucking stupid. Why are all the names getting worse as the story goes on? It was like, I don't know, I thought that was kind of funny. We get the Texas Wards and this one, uh, there's Young Buck. We're like, okay, that's, I kind of like that as like a Texas name or like an Ohio kind of name, like a place with a lot of hunting. There's a dude whose name is Strapping Lad. And that was what I was like, I love this name. <laughs> this is a 10 out of 10 name and no one can convince me otherwise. And Rage is like, this is literally the worst name I've ever heard. I got a good kick out of that. But from this point onwards, like, we are starting to fight Noel. So, I think I talked about this in one of the previous arcs, like, talking about her power and how I was understanding it. So, big as fuck, very strong, very fast, despite her size, rapid healing and regeneration. Okay. She can eat someone, like, she can touch a person... And absorb them into her, which is part of what makes her bigger. Okay. When she is absorbed somebody, they are not necessarily dead, but she has access to them, and then she can start cloning them. When she clones them, first off, she spits them out, like she vomits them. And that word was used several times. And then when you get to her interlude, I'm like, oh, got it. Makes perfect sense. But she vomits them, and the clone, they talk about, you know, it's meaner, it's more aggressive. There are differences. So, like, there can be one that's, like, a, the face is missing, or, like, there's tumors all over the body. It was like, okay, so it is definitely not a one-to-one. -one. Also, a cape will keep its powers, kind of. For example, like, because by the end, she absorbs the Undersiders. Not all of them. She gets uh, Regent, Skitter, Gru, Tattletail was somewhere else, Rachel was somewhere else. I don't remember if she got Imp or not. I think Imp was brought to safety, but I don't remember if she absorbed her. But, like, she summons a Skitter... And instead of controlling bugs, the Skitter is controlling rats. There's one with Gru where he's got, like, he can shoot his darkness, but there's, like, a string on it. I'm imagining it like a fucking yo-yo. And, like, in my head, this looks really cool. It's like, that's not something I think Gru can do. But, okay, like, there's a Vista she has that's, like, completely 2D. Like, this is so neat. Um, there's one Vista that was just 
radiation. It's like, oh yeah, if she hits you, you will get cancer and probably die in four years. Okay, that's a problem. But I like that a lot. It's like she can clone them and their powers, but there's always something off and always something wrong. I love that right as Regent is getting stuck in, he's like, hey, hey you! Can I clone of a goatee? <laughs> it's like shoves it back in there. Like, ah, that, that was fun. Um, there's a fight with Noel. Eidolon is doing some work. He's doing like cool gravity shit. Imp goes and like kills a clone and ends up like getting fucked up in the crossfire. She's alive, but she's badly injured. I remember Taylor having this conversation with one of the clones who just, he's like, yeah, like, hey, you hit her. Fuck you. Are you close with that person? Like to another clone, are you close to her? No, that bitch broke my heart and I want to kill her. But you're upset that I hurt her. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's her. You can't be doing that. And just the clones... Also weird, flexible Skinner morality. Like, it was it was really interesting shit. I liked it a lot. But it ends with um, Taylor getting gobbled up. And that's how the main story ends. So then we get our interludes, of which there's fucking five. The first one is with a Mr. Kevin Norton. The most powerful man in the world. He's in London. He's a bum with his dog. I think his dog is named Duke. Who's just asking for money. And he's like, you know, come. Like, I am the most powerful man in the world. The people are ignoring him. Not making eye contact. This one woman gives him a note. Uh, and he's like, hey, you know, like you gave me something nice. You're looking me in the eye. I appreciate that. It doesn't happen very often. Can I, can I show you something? You know, and thanks for this. She's like, ah, I don't know. I gotta meet my train. It's cool. It's fine. I just... There's something I need to do, and I don't want to do it alone. <sighs> okay, fine, I'll, I'll go with you. So they go, and he talks to her about his life. He's like, yeah, like I, I lived with this woman, and I realized I don't think I actually liked women in that way. And she did not take that very well. She's actually very abusive. You know, I had to move out, and it's hard to find a shelter as a battered man. And I ended up here, and it's, like, under this bridge near a park. He's like, I met someone here, and it changed my life forever, and it's about to change yours. And that person that he met is Scion, our literal golden boy, who's just sitting, like, it's raining, and then Scion is just there. He's not saying anything. It's like he's not even breathing He's just there. And I think when they talk about the rain, like, it's he's not getting wet. It's like the water's almost, like, avoiding him and shit. And he's like, yeah, um, I am the most powerful man in the world because I can tell Scion what to do. Now, it's not that I give him specific, like, hey, go do this, go do this. I told him if he has these powers, like, we, I don't know what the fuck Scion is. No one does. Like, is he an angel? Is he a fallen angel? Is he... Does he have powers naturally? Is this like a creation of man? No one knows. I certainly don't. But I told him to go help people. So that's what he does. Um, I told him to fight the Endbringers. And he started doing that. And what terrifies me is I know how powerful Scion is. I genuinely believe if he wanted to kill them, he probably could. But he wasn't given the command to kill them, was he? I gave him the command to fight them, to stop them. And I'm terrified that the reason the Endbringers are still around, the fact that he hasn't killed them, is because I didn't tell him to. If he hasn't killed them because he's genuinely unable, then, like, it is what it is. At least we have someone who'll stop them. But if he hasn't killed them because I didn't tell him to, how many deaths are on my head? And I haven't seen him in years because I know that's what I have to tell him. 
And if an Endbringer dies afterwards, I know all those deaths were on me. But if that's the case, I can't let any more happen. So we tell Sion, A, go kill them next time. And two, which does also, by the way, kind of make me wonder, like, Noelle's a baby Endbringer and all that. Are we about to see Sion, like, an Arc 19? I, I don't know. He also says, this woman, by the way, she's good people. If, you know, something happens to me, I want you to listen to her. And then, you know, kind of talks to her. He's like, yeah, you paid me, like, five pounds. Like, I don't remember what the number was. You know, like, five quid to now become the most powerful woman in the world. Fair deal, huh? And that's how that ends. And any time I get to see Sion, I just feel like, I want to know everything about you. And I don't know if I ever do. I think my friend was actually telling me, it's like, you learn a lot more about Scion in Ward than you do in Worm. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> what do you mean, delayed satisfaction? But like, I really want to know more about this dude. I thought it was super interesting. So the next one is Crusader. So Crusader's interlude, and like Kevin Norton's was partway through the plot. Crusader's was partway through the plot. His was him... Purity, Theo, Night, and Fog. I don't remember Night and Fog's real names. I, I know they're mentioned in the chapter. I think Crusader was Justin? That sounds about right. It The vibe I was getting is that he and Purity are maybe kind of sort of a thing. It seems like there's mutual attraction, but they're not quite a couple, but I, I'm not a hundo on that. So, standout things in this chapter. Number one, it's super unimportant. Night and Fog are so interesting to me. Like, here's these two people who, like, their powers work incredibly well together. When you don't look at night, she can turn into, like, this super, like, powerful monster. And Fog makes a fog so you can't fucking see her. Like, their synergy is incredible. They're a married couple dedicated to their routine. And you see, like, as they're interacting, like, uh, Fog is reading the paper and Knight's making breakfast. Crusader talks about how inhuman it is. It's like, yeah, like, Fog is reading the newspaper, but he's actively not reading it. He's just going through the motion. Knight makes breakfast, but she always makes way more than necessary because she doesn't seem to understand how much a human can actually eat or really, like, compensate for a human appetite. And they say the exact, they go through the exact same actions, say the exact same things at the exact same time. And it's creepy. And it's so cool. It's like, it's one of those moments where I'm like, I would love to see Worm adapted to just see these two interact and how like the sickeningly sweet 50 sitcom feel that it has, but it just really uncomfortable way it sounds amazing that's one thing another thing is theo still doesn't have his powers and they're trying to get him to trigger it's like jack slash is going to kill a thousand people we need to get you your powers now so we can train you we're already doing some basic training so you learn how to take care of yourself but theo has it triggered and they're not sure why also, they talk about, I don't know what the organization was called. It was like some organization in like Germany or something where Night and Fog come from. And it's like, oh yeah, they're on loan to us for the cause. They're like, oh right, Nazis. In case I was starting to maybe like these people, Nazis, of course. Um, They go, what was the school? I, I think it was like they went to Harvard. It was Harvard, Yale. It was some, like, noteworthy university. To talk to, like, someone in parahuman studies. Not William Anton. But talk to someone in parahuman studies. Wait. What was the name? I don't remember the name. Because they didn't talk to the guy. They talked to, like, his assistant. I remember it sounded like a Japanese name. Was it Yamada? Because later we get Jessica Yamada. And I don't know if she's related to that professor. Maybe I'm completely misremembering the name. But I ended up talking to this, like, TA or, like, research assistant about trigger events because they're trying to get Theo to trigger. And the big thing they talk about is people who have trigger events normally don't have a good support system because it's a flight-or-flight response. 
if you have a strong support system, you know, barring like some crazy shit like an Embraer attack, you're like, that's not gonna help. But you have people that you can go to. Like, you don't have to fight, you don't have to flight because you can talk to people. Isolation is usually a big deal with that. You know, they talk about how it's incredibly hard to force a trigger event, how there's some theories that the trigger event, it's not necessarily that the power is related to the trigger event, but it might be that the trigger event is related to the power. Like, okay, so let me rephrase that. It's not just like for Taylor. It's less that because her trigger event involved bugs, she got a bug power. And it's more of, there's a bug power, you have to get the bug trigger event to get the power. It is the power first and then the event, rather than the event happens and the power forms around it, which is a theory, but that's really interesting. Especially when you have the idea of passengers that, I don't know if, what I got from Noel, so like I'll talk about that here a little bit, Noelle is interacting with her passenger and it seems that her passenger had like an idea of kind of the person it wanted to bond with but didn't quite get that with Noelle so it's upset so I feel like the passenger and the power are already there and they're looking for the right person to bond with however the nemesis formula can almost like force a bonding to a passenger. That, that's kind of how I'm understanding it. I could be completely wrong. But because isolation is a big part of it, something Crusader had noted throughout the thing, also Crusader's powers, how he can basically project stands, is pretty fucking cool, by the way. He talks, he's like, okay, the reason I think Theo doesn't trigger is because of Puri. Because he has someone that will always stick up for him. He can't have a flight or, I mean, he's a third generation cape. He's Kaiser's son, all father's grandson. This kid should have triggered, but he's always able to cling to purity. So we're just going to leave him behind. So purity is convinced to do so. So Theo is left behind when like the police come. So I don't know if he gets arrested. I don't know if he gets like his ass beat. I don't know what's going to happen. Like I am because it had actually been something I thought about a while ago was has Theo triggered yet? Like, what is the deal with that? So I'm glad we got to follow up with that in some capacity. I'm very excited to keep following this storyline. Then we get Jessica Yamada's, which was very close to the end of the main story with the other two fault line and Noel just being like, like post story, essentially. This interlude might be my favorite in the entire story because this is easily one of my favorite chapters in Worm. It is about a therapist who works in a parahuman asylum and also working as a therapist for caves. So we see Victoria, who is not doing well, who can't talk. It seems like she, um, it's like, you know, they read letters from the alphabet and she blinks. They're like, okay, you want E, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's L, et cetera, et cetera. And she's trying to... It seems like she's trying to get in contact with Amy, but she can't because Amy's in the birdcage. And I don't know what she would want to say. I don't know if she wants to tell her, like, you know, go fuck yourself. You did this to me. I hate you. Or if the love for Amy or, like, the capacity to love Amy is still in there. So she wants to tell her, like, I forgive you. I love you. I don't know. But she's better, but not good. She goes to see this other person who, I wasn't quite sure what her name was, because again, I'm listening to it, I didn't read it. It was like Senta, Sienta, who's like this head with all these tendrils coming out of her that she can't control because it seems like Santa's like this really sweet young lady who's like, I'm so sorry. I don't want to hurt you. I can't control them. Meanwhile, the tendril, like Jessica has this specific suit that she's wearing and the tendrils like trying to rip it off and like rip off her arms and shit. That was cool. That was wild as Jessica's like, had like, it's no trouble. By the way, um, the, vo the voice actress for Jessica in this chapter was so good. I think that's another reason I loved it so much. Like, all the people reading in this chapter in particular fucking killed it and knocked it out of the park. 
Um, but, you know, as Santa's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to hurt you, I can't control it. It's okay. Just remember our exercises while thinking to herself, I am about to die. The suit is man like the suit is a piece of shit. I think someone else had used the suit and it didn't go through maintenance. And because it didn't go through maintenance, it's not as strong as it should be. I am going to get ripped apart. I'm going to fucking die. Holy fuck, I hate my life. It's okay. Just do your exercises. You know, I want to be in here with you. I want to be able to talk to you. Have you been writing in your journal? It was so interesting to me. Then we get to my favorite part, which is her giving therapy to the wards. So you've got my boy Dennis, we got Clockblocker, who's saying, I'm so frustrated that the villains keep winning. And it's not just like a pride thing that we keep losing, although that's part of it. It's, I, I became a hero because I genuinely want to help people. But look at what keeps happening to us. I lost my best friend. I lost another one of my good friends. Amy Dallins had her problems. But she helped my dad. She healed my dad. I know she's a good person. And look what happened to her after interacting with the Undersiders. The Undersiders are horrible people, I think. But they just keep winning. And we just keep losing. And this doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right i'm just just frustrated and you got weld who um doesn't really get to say much because he gets called out to a job one of the things i really liked about it is like so have you picked out a name yet nah just weld's fine and as he's leaving make sure you have a name next time he talks about how he's like yeah like i know i'm I've been told I'm a very marketable hero. I know I'm not entirely human and people judge me for that, but it is what it is. I can't control it, so I don't really care. It's just it's just good business. You have Flechette, which is Lily, who, I'm not going to lie, I was getting really emotional listening to it. I was like, I'm almost tearing up a little bit. Like, she's doing a great job. Like, both voice actresses, like, in this scene in particular, killed it. But she's talking about her friendship with Parian and how Parian has now joined the Undersiders. And, like, this is a friend that I had and someone that I have feelings for. And there's times where I think she reciprocates and times where I think she kind of reciprocates but doesn't feel the way I do. And other times where I don't think she feels that way for me at all. And now Skitter has gotten to her and you do see that Flechette got the um, Arms Master's armband. Or was it Arms Master? But she got the armband that Skitter... I think it was Skitter's armband in particular. And she's like, I haven't looked at it yet. And, like, I don't... Like, I know Skitter plays mind games and shit, which is so funny because Taylor's like, I'm not playing mind games, I'm just being honest. She's like, I know she can do that kind of shit, and I went to go confirm it, and I haven't checked yet, and I'm scared. Because if she's wrong like if she's playing me it means i fell for it which pisses me off and makes me feel like a bad hero if she's telling the truth it kind of shakes my worldview and i don't want that either and there's this moment where she just like starts crying on jessica's shoulder with all of the stress and the frustration and her heartbreaking and having to do all this work for the wards and like all these patrols and not having any time to sleep and also dealing with the shit with Skitter. Then Jessica gets a call about what happened to Triumph and Lily immediately go, she immediately goes from Lily into Flechette. I'm like, okay, I have to go make sure he's okay. Do I look okay? You look fine you look great while thinking to herself i hate how quickly she was able to transform like that like no kid should be able to do that i'm so sorry then you get k dubs you get kid Wood, who's like look i'm gonna be completely honest i don't want to do this i i'm sorry i've i've kind of stopped conforming to people's rules not in like a super villain kind of way but it's like i'm doing things my way you know i really am moving to the beat of my own drum and i couldn't be happier yeah like the city's fucked but i'm doing better like i'm actually working on shit again i love what i'm working on i don't need this i don't like no offense 
I'm just going to put my, do I have to actually answer any of your questions? No, you don't have to. Cool. So I'm just going to come in, put on my headphones and start working on shit. That cool? No. No, it's not. But I can't say anything. <laughs> uh, you have Vista, who Vista's the heart of the team. She's the therapist on the ground. But, like, she has this massive chip on her shoulder. Because when Jessica says anything, it's like, are you talking down to me? Are you condescending me? No, this is how I talk to anybody. Um, and, like, ways that she can maybe be a better therapist to people. <laughs> There's, I don't remember what she had said, but there, she talked about some shit that had happened to her that she was thinking of. Therapy that! And, and that was pretty funny. And after the wards, you get this last scene of her talking to Eidolon. Of Jessica talking to Eidolon. And him saying, he's like, okay, normally I would go to a priest because, you know, confidentiality, but your therapist, still confidentiality, I'm losing my power. And there are two people in the world who can fight the Endbringers effectively, me and Sion. And if I lose my powers, it's just Sion. And Sion is unreliable because we never know when the fuck he's going to show up. I, uh... This might be the end of my rope. My power is dwindling. Like, I feel like there's... It's like a well of power, and my well is running dry. And my hope, my sincere, honest-to-God hope, is that fighting Noel, like, whatever this thing is, will get my power up. Like, it'll, like, refill my well, you know? Like, if you push someone to... You know, like, a flight-or-flight response, like, a trigger event. Like, maybe I can get that power back fighting her so this is a fight to the death for me because if i i will fight her until she dies because like this is an end bringer situation this is what i'm for and hopefully i get my power and if i don't it means i'm worthless anyways so um if you were a priest i'd ask for you to send me like pray for me but good luck will suffice that's how it ended, and I, I love, I talk about all the shit I love in war. I love the powers, I love all the world building, and like the crazy shit, like trigger events, and cauldron, and passengers. I love the, like the bureaucracy, and the politicking, I love the ethical conversations, I like all those conversations about the label of a hero and a villain, and if you take the label away, could you tell who's a hero and who's a villain? I love these justifications, Skitter's flexible morality. I love a lot of the characters, and it's just these human moments and human elements, and that's what made this chapter so good. Fuck, it's already been almost an hour or so, two interludes left. Um, I can kind of go through fault lines pretty quick. Essentially, it's her crew is out of Brockton Bay looking for, it looks like they are looking for leads about Cauldron, that's how I'm understanding it. They have been able to find one. And this woman in a fedora goes into their hotel room and kicks the ever-living shit out of it. Like, Faultline is out of the room because she's having a conversation with Lisa, who's like, Hey, but it's me. Don't hang up. I want to hang up so bad. Look, I have a job. You know, it's nothing crazy. I just want to borrow Labyrinth for a bit. I'm on Labyrinth. Like, it's fucking weird. Okay, um, four million. Cool. I can do that. No problem. I took over Coil's business. Fuck you. Double it. Okay, done. Just send it to you. Like, fuck, I hate you. I hate that you basically have me pinned down. I I want to know their beef, because they have beef, and I have no idea why they have beef. Um, Because I know Faultline got to Spitfire before the Undersiders did, but it sounds like that is not the cause of the beef. That is a result of the beef. I don't know if I ever find out. I don't know if that's, like, later in the story. I don't know if that's a ward thing, or it's just you never do. Anyways, um, so Lisa's getting Labyrinth for something. I don't know if that's for Noel or if that's for something later. Uh, Fault Line is in Phoenix, and when she goes back into the hotel room, everyone is fucked up. No one's dead. At least it didn't seem like anyone was dead. And there was a note, which I think was just kind of like final warning. And it was signed C, and there was a dude named Kristoff, which, I don't, is that a C or a K? But I think the C was supposed to be for Cauldron. Like, hey... Fuck off. 
Also, uh, Gregor is now in a relationship with Shamrock. I don't remember if we had met Shamrock before. That sounds vaguely familiar, but maybe not quite. But I'm happy to see Gregor happy. Gregor just seems like he's a cool fucking dude. I I I'm almost kind of hyped for him. But uh, that was basically Fault Lines. And then it ends with Noelle, which hers is a little bit more backstory. It shows, like, a scene of them playing their game, whatever the fuck their game is. I don't really know how it works. And it's because something Trickster had said. She was a trickster. No, I think it was Ballistic. Talked about how Noelle is a strategist. She is not the kind of strategist where she comes up with a plan beforehand. It's more of she is, I mean, she can, but her strength is adapting to the situation at hand. Good fucking luck beating Noelle. Oh, yeah, that was another huge thing that happened in the actual story. Was the travelers show up and say, this is not Noelle anymore. We are going to help put her down, except for Trickster, who starts actively helping Noelle, and he's the one that actually helps her get the Undersiders. Anyways, but uh, it shows some backstory of Noelle, like, as a strategist back against the wall in the game. Uh, we're going to do this. The boom, 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 boom. This is how I'm at my best. We get a bit of her perspective of her breakup conversation with Kraus, you know, before everything went to shit. She talks about issues like with eating and with her diet and how like Mars is the only one who knows about that. The understanding I have, because they don't outright say it, is that she was bulimic, which if you know about bulimia, that's a you, you eat and you immediately throw it up because they keep talking about whenever she throws up a clone, like when she makes one, she vomits it out. I'm like, oh, that, mm, gotcha. That's fucked. Um, there was that. There's a moment where, like, she, her passenger keeps showing her things. Like, she, like kind of like how the seamer would put things in uh, her head. Her passenger is showing her, like, that breakup conversation. It's showing her, like, you know, your back was against the wall. You can be a good strategist. This uh, moment with Trickster, blah, blah, blah. And she's fighting for control and then just says, look, keep trickster safe i will give you control and then she sees a bit from the passenger's perspective i, I don't exactly remember what happened it was i feel like it was one of those where, like if i just sat down and read it it would probably click a little better but listening to it on 1.5 times speed because worm arcs are really long i am listening to them about 1.5 to get through them faster <laughs> sorry um I wasn't exactly sure what was going on, but it sounded like, you know, like it's, it had its designs and its plans and the fact that I'm not sure if it's necessarily that Noelle drank from the canister. My understanding was more, it's the fact that she didn't finish it, which also she didn't finish it, you know, because of her like weight concerns, which was interesting. It wasn't like I drank enough and I'm scared. I don't want to finish it. It's I'm, I'm a relapsing like bulimic or maybe it is anorexia. Maybe it's both. I don't want to finish drinking this. And that's what actively fucked up the passenger. Which means, it's like, I don't know if that means that the reason her power is, like, fucked up and possessing her is because that's the nature of the power. If Because I think that's something they've talked about is, like, your mindset at the time is important. If it was just because of her mindset that it's so fucked up, if it's the fact that she didn't finish it, if it's kind of a combination of both. But, um... It does end with her hitting up the Undersiders base and finding Tattletail, who's like, all right, show me what you got. And that, that's how it ended. So, 18, I liked 18. I think 18 was really good. I did not enjoy it quite as much as 16 or 17 overall. But that's not like a, man, the quality went down. It's like quality has been consistent. I just kind of preferred those. But I loved Taylor and Clocklocker's conversation. I loved Jessica's interlude. Arc 19 is going to end with Emma's interlude. I have been looking forward to getting into Emma's head since like chapter one. I'm so, so excited for this. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's my worm update. I don't, I'm very, very early in chapter 19. I was going to say that I don't even think I finished the first chapter yet. 
I feel like it's probably going to be kind of slow because of studying, which is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm definitely going to make, make sure I get some studying done today. But uh, I'll get to it when I get to it. Hopefully that'll be soon because story's really good and I'm very much looking forward to the end of the next arc.